want you to understand that I am under the leadership and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And he responded with a question that I asked him. What is it that I need to be focusing on? I know what I want to do, but what is it that I need to be focusing on? And of course, uh, where we are right now as Christians and as the body of Christ, and especially here at the District Heights Congregation, we are in the midst of what is called, what you would, uh, you may not understand, but we are in the midst of what is called a growth spurt. In church work, when you find that there is an opportunity that needs to be met by the local congregation, but yet the congregation is sitting there waiting on something to happen, that is when you are in the midst of a growth spurt. And any time that you find that growth spurt, that means that people have to understand that everybody has a part or a role to fulfill in the midst of that growth spurt. If we do not capitalize on it, what will happen is that everybody will begin to cease and everybody begin to settle down and nothing will be accomplished. In the midst of a growth spirit, we also have what is called the call of God. God is calling each and every member of his body to serve and to serve him. The problem is, is that we do not understand the call. We believe and we have been uh, been ostracized or we've been, uh, uh, for, been fulfilling so many desires, our own personal desires, until we have forgotten about the desire of God. You see, he has placed each member in the body as he so desires. And each member has a purpose to fulfill. But it's left up to you whether or not you're going to do what God asks you to do. And so as a result, we want to take some time and we want to look at a character study or do a character study on this fellow by the name of Gideon. Now, as we look at Gideon, it's very interesting that we find a lot of things that we can relate to. But I just want to remind you for just a moment, because I understand, yeah, we spent a great deal of time studying the, Old, the New Testament. But we need to be reminded of what Paul said in Romans chapter 15. And verse number four, he says, for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement gives you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus. Now, it's important that you and I understand how this works, because as we go back and we look at these individuals, as we look at these characters, many of us fail to realize that we do, we do, we can relate to these individuals as to how they handle certain things, how they dealt with the various challenges that God put forth. And many of us, we will find that many of us are no different than these individuals that we see in Scripture. As we go back and we begin in Judges chapter 6, and we find the text there, it's a very unique text, but we find that throughout Judges, throughout the book of Judges, disobedience and, rebel and rebellion seem to be a recurring theme among God's people. God's people seem, for some strange reason, throughout Judges, we find this concept. Let me take for just a moment and let's look at a couple scriptures here. As we look at this recurring theme in Judges chapter 3 and verse number 12, it says, Now the son of Israel, sons of Israel, did evil in the sight of the Lord. And so the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. Judges chapter 10 and verse number 6. Then the sons of Israel did evil. Did, again, did evil in the sight of the Lord. And they served Baal and the Asheroth and the gods of Aram, the gods of Sidon, the gods of, and the gods of Moab, the gods of the sons of Ammon, and the gods of Philistine. And thus they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. Do you see this reoccurring theme? And it doesn't stop there because when you begin to look at the Old Testament and we begin to look at our lives, we can pretty much see the same thing happening over and over and over again. 
It would be as if though we take one step forward and six steps back. Simply because we do not understand that God, as the fellows say, God doesn't like ugly. And all ugliness will be chastised. We're talking about the ugliness of sin. And then we find the absence of leadership, which led to more rebellion and disobedience. You see, as we mature in Christ, as we grow in the grace and the knowledge of truth, we will always find ourselves in a position or a situation to where we are called to be an example or a leader of those who do not understand God. You see, the whole mindset that we've been indoctrinated with in leadership, when we say leadership in the Lord's church, we always think elders and deacons. But we never think of the mature Christian who has a responsibility to other Christians to help them or to help raise them up. You see, we have to understand and undergo a paradigm shift. But when we look at what is happening in Judges, notice in Judges 17 in verse number 6, he says, in those days Israel had no king. And everyone did as he saw fit. That's in the NIV. And in I, the New King James Version says, as he so desires, I believe. In Judges chapter 21 and verse number 25, we find the same concept. It says, in those days, Israel had no king and everyone did as he saw fit. You see, in the days of the church, when we do not understand or recognize the Lordship of God, of Christ, we all are going to do what we want to do. That is a biblical principle. And so you and I have to understand how this works. But then we see the results in Judges chapter 2 and verse number 10. I'm laying a foundation for this series. In Judges chapter 2 and verse number 10 is what we see today. He says, and after that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. You see, all of the ugliness of sin has been transformed or trans or have been passed down to those who are younger. And let me say something, and I want you to think about it very, very seriously. We are seeing a generation of young people that are raising up, that are being raised up, that has no idea about who God is. And I'm not talking about a generation now that's ages 12 and 13. I'm talking about a generation that they call millennials now. That they call millennials. They do not know God. They assume that God is a great Santa Claus that gives me whatever I want and allows me to do whatever I want to do. And you see, they didn't get that. They didn't get that in church. They got that from their ancestors, their parents. There's that group of people who said, I'm not going to make my children go to church. I'm not going to teach them. I'm not going to do them like my parents did me, made me go to church. Every time I looked around, I was in church. And guess what? That generation has risen up who knows not God. You go to young people today and say, who's God? Who, what? No, I don't do church, man. I don't do church. No, 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 no. I got my phone. If I want to know something, I Google it. I'm, I'm telling you the truth. This is what's happening in our society. And you see, just like it happened then, whatever happened in the past, we can learn from these situations. It has happened. The Bible has says what was written, what was written in the past was written to what? Teach us so that through endurance and encouragement of the scriptures, we might have what? Hope. And let's move on and let's get over here and let's talk about Gideon for just a moment because Gideon is he is an interesting individual, and here he is, he's facing the call of God, the call of God, okay? Now, I want to spend some time talking about the call of God because many of us do not understand how this works. We have a certain mindset, has God called you? 
Somebody asked me once, it says, uh, uh, how do you know God is calling you to preach? Uh, how do you know God is calling you uh, to, to, to even to date somebody or whatever the case may be? And, and you get this question all the time. The problem with it is that many times over, we do not understand how the call of God works. God calls all people. The question is, are you looking forward to the call? You see, most people are not looking forward to the call because they have a mindset as to what they want to do, when they want to do it, and how they want to do it. But understand that when the call comes, you will know. You will know. But when that call comes, just like you and I, every one of us have the what is called the ability to say yes or no. We can surrender to the call or we can reject the call. We can surrender to the call or we can reject the call. I'm going to go to Proverbs chapter 1 and verse number 24 for just a moment. But let me just lay out this format here. Remind you of these things. First and foremost, God's call comes to all men and women. Whether you're lost or whether you're saved, God is calling you. That's right. Many times over, you get the religious people who believe that God only calls those who are saved. But over in Acts chapter 2 and verse number uh, 37 and following, he says, as many as the Lord our God shall call to himself. If you're lost, God is calling you to be in a safe relationship with him. You have the power to say yes or no. If you are saved, God is calling you to a particular task or task or a opportunity or a ministry to fulfill his will. You have the choice to say what? Yes or no. The call comes to all. Not just the preacher or church leaders. He calls all of us. But too many of us don't understand the call. God's call always has a purpose. Not only does it have a purpose, but this call is not about you. This is what messes a lot of us up. God does not call you because you are so beautiful. God calls you because you have a purpose. God calls you because he has something for you to do. And it's your decision whether you're going to say yes or no. In a few minutes, I'm going to show you how we respond to God's call. This call of God is, call, is a call to make a difference. Every place in the Bible when God calls somebody and when they answer, it was designed to make a difference in somebody's life. Starting with your own. You see, he's going to make a difference in your life first so that he can use you to do what he has called you to do. Sometimes in that call, he has what I may call a cleansing agent. He's going to straighten you out first before he sends you out. This is why too many individuals will not heed the call because they don't want to release the things that God wants that wants out of his out of their life, okay? And so my question to you is: Has He called you recently? And if He did, to what? I want us to go over to Proverbs chapter one and verse number twenty-four. Proverbs chapter one and verse number twenty-four. If you have it, say Amen. 
If you don't have it, say now. Nah. <laughs> In Proverbs, it says, because I have called you and you refuse. I have stretched out my hand and no one regard, regard it. Because you disdain all my counsel and would have none of my rebuke, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your terror comes. And when your terror comes like a storm, and your destruction comes like a whirlwind, and when distress and anguish come upon you, then they will call on me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but they will not find me, because they hate it. I want you to pay close attention to this. What? Knowledge. They despise knowledge. They rejected the knowledge of God. When one rejects the call, they also reject the knowledge of God. Let me see. Let's stop there. Don't stop there, Brother Hubbard. Keep it going while you got it going. He says, because, verse 29, because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, they would have none of my counsel and despise my every rebuke. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their own way and be filled with the full of their own fancies. For the turning away of the simple will slay them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. That doesn't sound like a pretty picture, does it? But all that comes through the rejection of the call. Now let's move in and let's go to work for just a moment with Gideon. As we look at Gideon, I want you to, throughout this series, to begin looking for the call of God. I believe that he is calling you, but yet because you are so full of self that you have found yourself rejecting the call of God when you don't really know that he's calling you. And so today, as we go through and get the call of Gideon, I want us to look at a couple of things for just a moment. In Judges chapter 6, beginning in verse number 11, Judges chapter 6 and verse number 11 says, Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Oprah, which belonged to Joash the Abizarite, while his son Gideon thresh, threshed wheat in the wine press in order to hide from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. For those of you who do not understand the terminology, the Lord is with you, you mighty warrior. Now I want you to pay close attention because this is not some fool's play here. You're finding Gideon now. He's hiding out in a wine press, threshing out the wheat, preparing food for his family. He's hiding away from the enemy. And not only is he hiding from the enemy, he's also hiding from God. And now God approaches him and calls him in such a way to where Gideon now takes two steps back. In other words, who are you really talking to? Because he began to respond to the call of God the way many of us do on a consistent basis. When God called us. First of all, he's hiding from the enemy. God knows exactly wherever you are. He knows where you are. He went directly to Gideon. The second thing, Gideon was also busy. He was busy minding his own business. He was busy trying to take care of his family well-being. He really didn't have time for anybody else. He had turned in on himself. This is my family. This is about me. This is about us. Nobody else. But something very interesting happened in that conversation. I want you to notice very closely there 
Because in verse number 13, Gideon does what so many of us do so often. We discount our calling. We discount our purpose. We discount our reason for being. Now notice, he calls, the angel of the Lord calls him a mighty man of valor. He's a mighty warrior. And here's another interesting thing. God always calls us in what he sees us as. He didn't see Gideon as a, a, a bumbling idiot. He didn't see Gideon as an individual who's afraid or whatever the case may be. He saw him as a mighty warrior. You see, many of us don't see ourselves as the way God sees us. As somebody who's worth something, somebody who is worthwhile. Someone who has purpose. Notice what he does. He discounts himself before a holy God. Notice this. Verse 13. Gideon said to him, Oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all of this happened to us? And where are all his miracles, which our fathers, I told, our fathers told us about saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of, Midian, of the Midianites. Do you see what he's doing? Do you see what he's doing? Do you see what you do? Do you see what I do? We don't see ourselves the way God sees us. We always choose the low road. Well, I know he didn't call me because I ain't got this. I did this. I've done that. I'm this. All kind of crazy stuff. How does God really see you? I want you to understand something. If you belong to the Lord, if God is your father, why would a loving father see you so low when he has given you that which will raise you up? How would you like to have that kind of father who's always putting you down? You see, that's what fathers do in the world now, simply because they haven't been trained how to be fathers. Or many of, them, many of them found their way into fatherhood not wanting to be fathers. And as a result, that stuff is being visited upon what? The children. And as a result, the generation continues to excel that same way. But not God. We discount ourselves and our purpose in so many given situations that God placed before us for us to increase. Look what happens here. Verse 14. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, <coughs> excuse me, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Now wait a minute. He didn't even address Gideon's issues. You notice that? Didn't even address. Look again. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? Look at verse 15. So he said to him, O oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, He's not talking about Virginia. He says, and I'm the least in my father's house. Do you see what he's doing here again? The same thing we do when God calls us. We start discounting ourselves. It has become a habit to us. It has become a serious habit. And we are missing some of the greatest blessings that God has in store for us simply because we discount ourselves in the call of God. Watch what happens now. 
verse 16. You think the Lord would respond? He did. And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. Wait a minute, wait, wait. Lord, did you not hear what I just said? My clan, I'm the weakest. My clan is the weakest. My clan is this. My clan. He didn't even address Gideon's foolishness. God knew what was in him. God knew his purpose. He knew and understood why and what was in Gideon. And it's the same thing with us. As we look at this context here, I want us to keep these things in mind. He was looking at Gideon through his purpose. He was called to save Israel. And he was looking at Gideon through his purpose. He was what? A mighty warrior. But Gideon didn't think so. Gideon didn't think so. And so when we begin to look at the concept of the understanding of the call of God, and I'm going to take my time, I want to take my time with this because I believe that we're on to something here because we're at that place to where we've got to focus on the call of God because he is calling us, he is calling us to do a great work for him on this corner. And every member has a role or a function to play. We have got to get away, and I announced this morning, there used to be a time when we said have what is called that 80-20 80, rule. 80% 80 of the work of the church is being done by what? 20% of the people. Those statistics have changed. 90% of the work is being done by 10% of the people. And we're wondering what's wrong with us. Why aren't we growing? Why aren't we doing whatever the case may be? Because too many brothers and sisters are not open to the call of God. Now let me help you to understand how this works. First and foremost, when God calls you, you're going to be busy. He never calls somebody sitting around doing nothing. That's right. He never calls a person who is sitting around doing nothing. He always calls us when we're busy. When we call and approach brothers or sisters that we need your help to do a certain thing, the first thing, well, I got this, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And, and, and you know, when you listen to them, and, and, and only a small amount of what they're doing is basically for the church. God also calls us through prayer. You'll be, some, you'll be amazed that when I go to God in prayer and ask God, who can I call on to do certain things? And, and this is something that I, I, I aim to do. When I approach a brother or a sister, I have prayed about it. And I pursue you because God has given me that direction. And, the, and, and you know what has happened? What is so, it's so amazing. And I always ask individuals to pray about this. Pray about it, pray about it, and then I'll come back in a week and let me see if God has led you. And you go back to that individual and say, no, I'm not going to do it. Did you pray about it? Well, no, I really didn't pray about it. I said, I know. I know you didn't. I know you didn't pray. How do you know that, Brother Hubble? Because I believe that God will never lead you to someone that he did not want to serve in a certain place. I trust his decision. You see, years ago, I used to grab people, put people in different places, and all those things, and then all of a sudden, it blows up. Why? Because it was something I wanted and not what God wanted. I had to learn that lesson. But you know, the interesting thing is, is that we are all busy. But the question is, are you busy doing the right thing? Are you too busy to do the Lord's will? If you are too busy to do the Lord's will, then you are too busy. Way too busy, okay? God calls us when we're hiding. He calls us when we're hiding. Now, if we were to pull the covers back this morning, Many of us sitting right here right now are hiding from God. 
How can you tell, Brother Hubbard? I can tell the way you handle things. You don't want to be <laughs> visualized. You don't want to be seen a certain way. You don't want to be seen in certain situations. Number one, you hide because you don't come to Bible class. Oh, I know all of that, you know. I don't, I don't go to Bible class. I, that's for kids or whatever. There are some Christians don't going to go because Bible class challenges them to think. And as a result, you're hiding from God. No, I don't do Wednesday nights because I, I, I you know, hope that, uh, you know, but I, I don't really need that. You know, once a week is good for me. You're hiding. Why you say that, Brother Hubbard? Because the word exposes certain things. And there are brothers and sisters who do not want certain things in their life exposed. I'm not saying you put your stuff out there, but the scriptures reveal things to you, just like it's revealing to you now the call of God. He calls us as he sees us. He calls us as he sees us. That's right. If he sees you as an individual who can handle things or whatever the case may be, just like in the situation with, 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 with Gideon, Gideon didn't see himself as a mighty warrior, but God called him a mighty warrior because he knew that he was going to have to stand and face a certain enemy. You're a mighty man of valor. And that's what I mean. You go back and you look at Moses. He took Moses from Pharaoh's household, placed him out in the wilderness to be a what? A shepherd to his father-in-law's sheep for a period of what? 40 years. And then he called him out as a great shepherd to go back into Egypt to shepherd his people and bring out, bring them out of Egypt. You see, God calls us. But you see, we're so wrapped up in situations until we can't even hear that gentle whisper. He also calls us with an intended purpose to fulfill. And nine times out of ten, it's not what you want to do. It's not what you want to do. And when you call, talk to a brother or sister and say, look, I believe that God is calling you to learn how to teach or to teach or whatever the case may be. No, that ain't me. That's not my gift. That's not me. I don't know. <laughs> well, what is your gift? I don't know, but that's not it. Do, do you see what's happening? Well, I want to teach. That's my gift. That's my gift. Well, you need to come and learn something. No, no, no. I don't have time for that. I know everything I need to know. Well, quite naturally, God is not calling you to be a teacher. Because one of the first tenets in becoming a teacher, you have got to become teachable. If you are not teachable, you don't need to be teaching. Okay? All right? If you are not open to learning, you don't need to be Teach it, because there's some things that God wants to teach you that you need to learn. That's right. You see how this works? You say, he has an intended purpose for you to fulfill. And when he calls you, he expects a response. You know, we have been programmed at our house that when the, tele the main line Ring And let me say this to you, church members. If you ever call our home line, let it ring more than three times. Okay? As a matter of fact, let it ring at least five, six, seven, eight times. Okay? And we'll answer it. Now, why we do that? Well, you know why. Telemarketers call, and they call, and if you don't answer in three rings, what do they do? Hang up. So when you call, we've been conditioned. And you let it ring three times, maybe four. And we'll pick it up on that fourth one. By that time, you done already made your mind, huh? Yeah. You know? So I want you to understand, when you call, expect a response. That's what you do, right? When you call, you expect a response, don't you? 
I know, I know. Wait a minute, I need to change that. When you text, you expect a response, don't you? Huh? You expect a response. And you expect a response how soon? Immediately. That's very interesting. We've been programmed in such a way. You call somebody this day and time, they won't answer the phone, but you send them a text. Bam. You know why they do that? They can control the conversation. You see, when you talk to a person face one on one, either by phone or by face, you got to be real. You see, with a text, I can control the situation. You didn't know why that was happening, huh? did you? Huh? I can control the conversation with this text. That's how powerful I am. If I don't want to answer it, I won't answer it. If I want to keep you hanging out there, I keep you hanging out there. I'm controlling this. And then when I answer you, even though I have put you off, I expect you to respond immediately. Well, I just sucked all that out of the room. Well, I wanted to think about this. When God calls you, he's also expecting a response. You see, in this day and time, Believe it or not, we have to teach church members how to respond to the call of God. Whether that be in worship, whether that be on the street, whatever the case may be, you've got to be trained, you've got to be equipped to learn how to respond to the call of God. Because you have been indoctrinated with the ways of the world that I don't respond when I'm ready to respond and how I want to respond. Because if I respond a certain way, then the people are going to see me a certain way, whatever the case may be. It's all about aesthetics instead of service. How many sermons have you listened to and the Holy Spirit says you need to repent, you need to respond, you need to ask the church to pray for you if you have to just crawl down the aisle. You know the first sex and the next thing that comes to your mind? I refuse to do that because I'm I have my pride. But let me remind you what Proverbs say, pride goes before a fall. Pride keeps us. Pride keeps us from responding to the call of God. Especially among me. Well, Brother Hubbard, this is too hard. How do you handle the call of God? How do you handle the call of God? First of all, this is the way we do it, okay? This is the way we do it. First and foremost, we make excuses. We tell a lie. An excuse is just a cute way of saying it's a lie. I'm not making excuses. Uh, well, I don't want to lie to you, but I'm not making any excuses. Where are you lying? An excuse, if you really understand the definition of excuse, an excuse is a sham reason that only satisfies the person who makes it. That is an educated way of saying it's a lie. That's right. The second thing, we embrace feelings of being pushed. You're pushing me. Or you're trying to force me to do, do something that I'm not ready to do. Well, why are you doing all these other things? Were you ready to do that? You know? <laughs> you know? Anytime that God calls us, we feel like we, you, you, you're pushing me. You're pushing me. You, you're pushing me. You, I, I'm not ready for that yet. I'm not, I have to grow to that level. Whatever You keep procrastinating is what you do. Here's another one, very common one. God calls you to serve or to do. I'll do it, but I'm going to mess it up for you. You won't ask me again. There are brothers and sisters who are like that. Well, I don't want to do it, but I'm, I'll mess it up for you. Instead of saying, look, I don't know how that works, but I'm willing to learn, okay? Can you help me learn or whatever to create more problems? Here's another one. 
I don't know. That's foul. Uh -uh, uh uh I cry foul and blame others. See, see if other people had done this or whatever, that's what Gideon did. He blamed God. Then number five, I don't think he's calling me. You doubt his call. You doubt his call. You doubt his call. Several years ago, I was working with a couple. And a um, young man said, I don't think God is calling me to marry her, but I'm going to go through the counseling and stuff. But I don't think he's calling me. Well, why are you going to go through this counseling if you don't think he's calling you to marry her? Well, you know, I'm just not ready to do this and this, that, and other. I said, well, I'll tell you what. Does she know? Well, no, I, I've been trying to say something, but she ain't listening. Well, does that make sense? But he expected it to make sense to me. I'm not educated in the stupidity. I need reality. You see, sometimes we need to listen to what we're thinking. Because if it don't make sense to us, <laughs> don't expect it to make sense to anybody else. You know? Sometimes we just say stuff to say it, you know? And then, here's number six. We create our own little concept, sets of belief. Well, if the Lord is calling me, he's going to make sure I have this call to do this and do that, do this, do this, do that, whatever. This way I know he's calling me. Well, I believe that this is the way he wants it done. I know what the Bible says, but I believe this way. And he's calling me to do it this way. But wait a minute, what does the Bible say? Well, I, he's calling me, but I believe it's this way. You see, you create your own set of ideas and belief. Well, I don't, I don't believe in, in place and membership, but I'm going to be here to serve. Wait, wait, wait. What will, why did you come to that conclusion? How did you come arrive at this place? You see, it's, it's easy for us to create a bunch of foolishness and believe it instead of believing the truth. And we're some interesting people. And we get this situation, and we put this situation out there simply because we've been indoctrinated by the ways of the world. Whatever happened to individuals saying, speak, Lord, your servant here. Here I am. Lord, send me. And here's the number seven. We run and hide. We run and hide. But wherever you go, wherever you go, God knows exactly where you is, where you are. Okay? But how do we embrace God's call? I'm going to touch on these quite rapidly, but I, uh, I, we're going to come back and, and, and get more into these next week. There's seven ways that we embrace God's call. There's seven ways that we can do that, okay? First and foremost, refuse to use stall tactics. In other words, stop procrastinating. Stop procrastinating, okay? Stop blaming other people, okay? Stop blaming other people, okay? Number two, stop hiding or running from God. After all, the scripture tells us that wherever we go, he's already there. That's right. Focus on the power and the strength that God supplies instead of your own weaknesses. You see, if Gideon had focused on his weaknesses, he never would have heard the call of God. He'd already been storing this stuff up. He'd already had this excuse. He already had all of this stuff loaded up. That's why he was able to just pop it right off. Well, my tribe is the weakest. My tribe is this. I can't do this. I can't do that. I'm not qualified. I don't not, I'm not married. I'm not this. I'm not that. I don't have any children. I don't do. Stop putting all that junk in front of your service. 
God has a purpose for you. It is designated exclusively for you. And then, number four, you need to remember who you belong to. You are not your own. We have been bought with a price. Now the question we have to ask, was it worth the deal? We've been bought with a price. Christ Jesus died. As a matter of fact, in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse number 21, we hear it so often. God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us so that we might become what? The righteousness of God. That's how God sees us. And so we're going to have to undergo that paradigm shift. And then number five, God is going to give you everything that you need to do what he calls you to do. I've been sharing this with the church for years, right here at District Heights. And if you've been here for any amount of time, I want you to understand this fact. And I can speak on it and you can speak on it. Everything that we ever needed to do a work for the Lord, he gave it to us. Not only did he give it to us, but he gave us even sometimes more than what we could even handle. Now let's talk about you for just a moment. When God calls you, he's going to also provide you with everything that you need to do the job. You are not going to go into this thing by yourself and operate on your own power. That's another problem that we have. It's not about you. It's about him. And number six, we've got to become sensitive to his calling by opening up the word and applying it by opening up the word and applying it. You got to spend some time in the book. And let, me, let me, and let me say this. Do not approach God's word with your convictions already formed. You know what he's going to say. You know and you believe it is this way. You will never learn anything from it. You will never learn anything from it. You got to approach him with a desire to learn from him. And number seven, which is the greatest and the largest, when he calls, surrender. When God calls you, surrender. Surrender according to his word and surrender according to his plan. And you see, get it responded to the will of the Lord. As you notice, and you look, and you look at verse number 25 and following, and we'll pick up this uh, next week as we go through this series. And I want this to be a teaching series. I don't want to preach it to you. I want to teach it to you because there's something here for all of us as we face this new year. In verse number 25, it says, Now it came to pass the same night that the Lord said to him, Take your father's young bull. And the second bull of seven years old and tear down the altar of Baal that is in that your father has and has cut down the and, and cut down the wooden image that is beside it and build an altar to the Lord your God on top of this rock in the proper arrangement and take the second bull and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the image which, shall, which you shall cut down. So Gideon took ten men from among his servants and did as the Lord has said to him. But because he feared his father's household and the men of the city too much, he did it he, too much to do it by day. He did it by night. He got it done, in other words. Now, let me help you to understand this. His first mission was to clean up his household. That's right. You know where I'm going next, right? The first mission is that you're going to have to straighten up some things in the house. You got to get rid of some stuff in your house. You got to get that devil out of there. Don't let him sit on the porch. Huh? <laughs> 
You got to get the devil out the house. If the devil won't leave, you might need to leave. <laughs> huh? You might need to leave. Remember, it's not about you. It's about God's will. Do y'all believe in prayer? Sometimes you might need to pray. Ask the Lord, intervene in this house. Show me what I need to do and be willing to do it. You see, when we look at the call of Gideon, there's a lot of Gideon in all of us. So when God calls you, how will you answer is the question. Because he's going to call you. He calls everybody. The good, the bad, and the indifferent. He calls us all. Now the question is, are you open to the response? But let me say this. He calls. Every one of us is going to respond. Either yes or no. There's no I trying and I'm trying to respond. Either you're going to respond or you're not. Well, I'm thinking about it. No, 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 no. It's either yes or no. He didn't tell Gideon to think about it for a minute. He laid it out for him. This is what I want you to do. You see, you have got to be open to the call is what I'm saying. If you are not open to the call, you're going to consistently find yourself operating in one of those seven areas. The seven areas how we respond to the Lord. Consistently. That's a fact. So the question is, when God calls, who, me? He's calling. He's calling someone in the day. As a matter of fact, he's calling every one of us. He's calling every one of us. He's calling. Now the question is, will you listen? You see, he provides us with daily opportunities to obey and to surrender according to his will. He provides us an opportunity to serve him in some special way or some form every day that we live. He provides us the opportunity of choice, either to accept or reject. That's right. You can accept it or reject it. This is absolute. Either you do or you don't. Either you will or you won't. That's right. Now, what will your answer be? The Bible tells us that God wants all of us to be saved. He does. He does not want to destroy anyone. He does not want to destroy anyone. You see, he has called all men. He's calling all men and all women to be saved. The Bible tells us how he's going to do that. He calls us through the gospel, which is the death and the burial and the resurrection of his dear son, Jesus Christ. And we ought to believe that and have faith in that word. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. We also need to repent. We need to turn away from self, turn away from selfishness, turn away from all of the wickedness in this world and turn to him. That's right. We need to repent. Religious error, we need to repent. We need to turn away from it and obey Christ. We need to confess Christ before others. And he will confess us before his father who is in heaven. And we need to be baptized into Christ. Your bapti being baptized into Christ is symbolic, is an example. It is a response to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You comply with the gospel. We die to sin. We're buried in a watery grave. We're raised to walk in newness of life. That's right. You see, newness of life does not begin until after baptism. He who believes and is baptized shall be what? Saved. He who believeth not shall be what? Condemned. God is calling you. If you have not obeyed the glorious gospel, he's calling you. What are you going to do? Reject or accept? 
Well, I don't believe like that. Well, see, remember those excuses? Remember those seven things? Do you see how quick we comply with the ways of the world and the ways of ourself instead of heeding the call of God today? We are quick to respond to things that are worldly than we are to respond to things that are spiritual. That's right. That's exactly right. But as you're baptized into Christ, you're called to live a life of faithfulness. Now, maybe you've obeyed the gospel. Is God calling you? Is he calling you to live right? Is he calling you to repent for rejecting his call, his past call? Or the worries of the world screaming so loud until you can't even hear. As the prophet says, as he speaks to us in a quiet whisper. You see, some people don't want to hear what God has to say. They don't want to hear the call. And then they'll say, well, I didn't hear him call me. No, 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 no. You ignored the call. There's a big difference. You ignored the call. Because when he calls you, you know. You know that it's him calling you. So where are you today? Is he calling you? Are you answering? Are you rejecting? If you're rejecting him, you need to repent as we stand and sing.